ISIS. Well, the first thing I should say is it's not a terrorist organisation. <laughs> ISIS is a neutron and muon facility that's designed to deliver neutron beams for users. So they put samples in the beam line to study things like the structure of materials, how they work, all sorts of things from material science to biology to environmental science. So ISIS started operating in 1984, producing the first neutrons. And the way that we produce the neutrons is by shooting protons into a heavy metal target at very high velocity. The heavy metal contains lots of neutrons because it is big atomic nuclei and the nuclei are quite unstable. So if you hit them hard, you knock bits off. But obviously we had to build a particle accelerator to do that. So neutrons are non-charged particles. You can't accelerate those because you need to use charged particle in an electric field. So we smash the protons at high energy into a target and then neutrons come out of that target. So around this so-called target, we have beam lines for users. So it happens 50 times a second. Four of those pulses go to this target station and one of those five pulses goes to the other target station. At its full capacity, we use about 10 megawatts of power. It takes many, many millions of volts to be able to pull neutrons out of atoms. You have to overcome the strong nuclear force and that's why we have to smash them so hard with a proton beam and it takes lots and lots of energy to actually build the power in that proton beam up. So my name's Susie Shi and I design particle accelerators for various applications. So we're currently standing in the heart of the ISIS neutron and muon facility, which is an 800 mega electron volt proton synchrotron. There's two main systems around a synchrotron like ISIS that need lots of power. Uh, one of them is the accelerating system, which are these uh, big, uh, what we call radio frequency cavities, which there's one just, uh, just behind us here. It's a radio frequency cavity. So they use quite a lot of power to accelerate the particles. The main magnets in this machine repeat 10 times around the circumference. And in each section, you'll see one of these big yellow magnets. It's about four and a half meters long, weighs about 35 tons, and it's just there to bend the beam. These green ones here are called quadrupole magnets. They focus and defocus the beam to keep it stable and under control. Each of those magnets has a field inside it, but that field needs to change during the acceleration cycle. So my name's John Thomason, I'm Accelerator Division Head for ISIS, and that means I'm in charge of all the equipment that keeps the accelerators running, and all the people who keep that equipment running. Because effectively the magnets are bending the particles around in a circle. It's a particle accelerator, so you can guess that the particles are going to go faster while you're doing that, so the field strength needs to increase in the magnet. The beam goes around about 10,000 times in its acceleration cycle, but that happens 50 times every second. As the beam gains energy, we have to synchronise the increase in the magnetic field in order to keep that beam travelling around the same circle the whole time. Okay, you're in the main capacitor room for the ISIS synchrotron. Basically, this is part of the system which powers the main magnets in the synchrotron ring. So I'm Steve West, I'm an electrical engineer and I work in the ISIS electrical engineering group. What we use to power the magnets is a resonant circuit and we use resonance to make it easier to get the power into the magnet. So current oscillates back and forth in the circuit and it allows us to very quickly move energy in and out of the magnets. We can store that energy efficiently within the circuit and effectively kind of slosh it around rather than pulling in new energy continuously from the grid. You have 10 what we call super periods or groups of magnets around the synchrotron and you have 10 capacitor banks in here, one for each super period and they're all part of this circuit which allows us to swing the energy backwards and forwards. And the resonant circuit has an inductance, a capacitance and a resistance. The part of that that is called the choke is providing the inductance in that circuit. We have 10 main sets of magnets, so in an ideal world we'll have 10 separate chokes, but it so happens when we first built the machine we inherited a choke which can do 10 different 
actions all at the same time, but it's an integrated choke, so it all looks like one big lump of metal. And it looks a bit like a transformer, which some people might be familiar with, and it stores energy in a magnetic field. But basically, it's a big lump of iron with a coil of wire around it. Swear Concrete Building is the old choke house, and this is what you see here. You, there's a big steel tank, the choke is inside that. The whole thing is oil cooled. So if any one part of that goes wrong, it's extremely difficult to mend. So we're trying to move away from that now and have one where we have 10 separate chokes. The new system, it's been split so that instead of all being built into this one single block of steel, it's been split into 10 separate ones. We need 10 of these chokes. If you count them, you'll find there's 12. It'll be very easy if one of these failed in some way, just to switch onto one of the spares and that could be done in a few hours. That's one of the reasons why we've built this system, is to add that extra bit of safety. It's a bit like the kidneys. You need them, you can't do without them, but if you lose one, actually you'll still be all right. Not just the choke system, it's in common with a number of other components on ISIS, because a 30-year-old accelerator is old enough, many of the components are 50 or even 60 years old. So it's an ongoing worry that there are going to be single point failures that wouldn't just take you off because we get that kind of thing all the time and we have armies of people who come in and mend them, but would take you off for a significant amount of time. The maintenance teams are absolutely vital to what goes on here. So we have scheduled maintenance periods where we basically pick up all of the problems that have accumulated during a user run and deal with them and we're generally off for between a week and four weeks depending on what time of year it is and this is all scheduled at least a couple of years in advance. So I'm uh, Aaron, I'm a third year apprentice, currently I'm working in the ISIS technical support workshop. I'd say the maintenance teams are probably the most important teams that are here. Without them it, it just wouldn't happen. I've always been hands-on, like I've been able to fix cars, like I've restored classic cars, I've worked on motorbikes and ISIS is definitely more complicated than a classic car. Um, but I'd say when you're working on the system for so long and you've put so much hard work into it, it's hard not to get like, a bit attached. And like as humans, we need care and attention. Like, that's the main part of the job, is to give it care and attention, just to keep it going. There's a relationship there between the people and the accelerator. And generally speaking, it's a very loving one. Possibly a bad analogy, but it's a bit like having an aging parent or something like that, that you owe it something, it owes you something. It's almost like a symbiotic relationship, if you like. You know, we have a facility where there's maybe a thousand people, there's users coming from all over the world. They're trying to understand how we can use particles from inside the atom that we can't see with our own eyes and then say, save babies' lives or make better aeroplanes that don't fall out of the sky. So that's, that's an incredible human story because we would not be able to do such amazing science without both that technology and the people behind it.